There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent, be still, and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Hey guys and gals, this is Jay Campbell. And uh, I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with the one and only Laura Knight Yadchik. And of course, my good friend, Hunter Williams. Laura, it is an honor to have you here today. How are you? I'm fine, and I hope you all are fine over there. I bet it's warmer there than it's here. They are spraying the skies, Laura, so bad in South Florida nowadays that it's a random day when you actually see the sunshine. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. It's Girl. insane. We did have a week of sunshine un uninhibited uh, about 10 days ago, but since then, it's just... If there's a glint of it in the morning, the, the planes are quickly in the sky spraying whatever it is they're spraying, and then it's gone. And Hunter's in North Carolina. How, what's it like up there right now, brother? Uh, it's a little cold, a little rainy. Kind of looks like a January day here in March. But um, it's been nice this past week, so a lot of sunshine and everything. So I'll take it. Cool. And Not too bad. Laura is in the countryside of Fonts. Correct, Laura? Yeah. <laughs> middle of the apple and kiwi fields in the middle of the apple and kiwi fields amazing so I'll, let me i'll just do a quick short introduction so laura has volunteered to spend time with us in a series of podcasts i didn't really covering forest me yeah she's been coerced <laughs> we're holding you against your will she's <laughs> she's been forced by us to do uh who knows how many uh episodes slash podcast slash um series of covering really her books a little bit of her life her story and i would say probably you know how it correlates and winds into today and whatever today is in uh march of 2024 and where we're going um why don't you just i think for a little bit just you know to talk about the books the book you know and, and again i know you have a lot of books but you know the wave series um Maybe just kind of summarize at a high level it's why a, you wrote those books. Why I wrote those books. Okay. That's, uh, I don't know whether I need to see or not. Um, yeah. Back in the day, early days of the internet, you know, 19, what, 92 and 93. And, uh, you get a you get an account. You have the internet. You have Alta Vista. You have uh, uh, that's your search engine. And you have uh, what was it called? Uh, it was that website. Does anybody remember what it was? It, uh, didn't CompuServe or AOL? AOL, yeah, AOL. And then the only way any real, I mean, you could get into some discussions on AOL. But they weren't very satisfactory because of the way the software was working. But, you know, you'd get on email lists, different people and talk about things. And uh, so I was on several email lists and I was on, I saw on the AOL chats uh, about UFOs and aliens. And, um, yeah. And I, the thing was, was my background was that I had been reading and researching the paranormal since I was probably 13 years old. Uh, and that was the age I was when uh, there was an old man, my, my brother cut his grass. He lived in a town called Arapica, which ever hear so up for north of Hudson, uh, which is north of Newport Ritchie, which is north of Tampa. I'm, I'm vaguely uh, familiar ever since I talked to you about that, but not, not originally until I, I talked to you. It's, it's the town time for God. It still is. Right. Uh, but anyway, so he lived up there and my brother would go cut his grass for him. And uh, uh, my mother 
made a, he was an old man. So my mother made some meals to take over to him and I went with her and he had this incredible library and he had inherited it from his mother who had been a member of the Society for Psychical Research wow. in England. So she, they had all of the proceedings. And so he allowed me to, you know, borrow these books and read them. And so I read them and they had books about shamans and books about, you know, Hawaiian uh, shamanic magic type thing, you know, kahunas and that sort of thing. And that was really kind of what got me started at 13 years old. And, uh, you know, it just kept offered in. And then when I was in, in college, I, I took, uh, took a, uh, a, a seminar in learning to do hypnotherapy. And so I started doing hypnotherapy. And of course, you know, when you're in college, everybody wants to be hypnotized, you know, tell me all I learned. And, and uh, so we were doing, you know, my, my girlfriend and my, well, I have two, two girlfriends and myself, we were doing a lot of hypnosis, uh, just about anybody that, you know, asked us to. And we were doing past life regressions because I was continuing to read and reading all the Edgar Casey stuff and all about people that, uh, you know, things like, uh, the Brighton Murphy and past lives and so forth. So, you know, I didn't know whether I believed it or not, but I was going to play with it anyway. And I had some really remarkable experiences doing, doing these, um, uh, hypnotherapy sessions and, um, uh, you know, going on and on. And then of course, as, as I, as I got older and I, I continued to read and research, I got into biblical research back in, in 1985 when I had my, my fourth child, because I was bedridden and I, I, I couldn't do anything, couldn't do anything else. And I was also subscribed to the Edgar Casey library in Virginia beach, you know, library by mail, this was before the internet. So. Uh, they would send you a stack of books and you'd read them and then you'd send them back. And, uh, I, you know, so it just, I just kept going and going and going and I kept copious notes and I have boxes full of notebooks that are full of these notes. But when I would write notes, you know, I would write something about what I was reading, but then the things would start coming in my head and I would start, you know, my brain would be reacting to it or I don't even know if it was my brain or if it was something else that I was reacting to it. Like, you know, that doesn't sound quite right. What about this? Et cetera. And I still do that when I write notes. So I, I, I had this and I, and I would continue doing hypnotherapy, you know, off and on during the years. And then at one point I worked with a psychologist. I was, I was working for the, the state of Florida, uh, in the, in the welfare office. And I, uh, also, whatever it happened, I had a lot of stress. So I went to a psychologist to see if I could control my stress because the doctor told me he couldn't give me any more shots of cortisone. So. I went to the psychologist and we got to talking and so forth, you know, he found about my interest in hypnotherapy, you know, he was going to hypnotize me. Well, I can't be hypnotized. Um, anyway, so he said, well, you're really good. Cause you know, I tried working on him and he was really good. You know, said, would you mind working with some of my patients, you know, especially women, you know, who didn't want to be hypnotized by a man. And I said, yes. So I did that. And then there was some other, uh, strange odd cases that would come along somebody would just hear that i did it and they would just you know say my cousin needs help would you to help him out so i would do that proceeding on so along comes the whole new age movement and uh channeling's a big thing so naturally i had to read everything about that i mean you should they have probably what, 20, 25,000 books in this house. You know, awesome. I've got a 75 foot hallway. It's lined with bookcases. And then I have bookcases downstairs in the studio, but I've got bookcases at the top of the stair. I've got stashed, stashed everywhere. Did you bring your books with you from the States? Yes, I did. That's awesome. And, uh, if I go anywhere else, <laughs> that's the main thing I'm going to take. 
<laughs> right. Right. Books and the piano. <laughs> so uh, I just, yeah, I had a, a lot of experience and I was, I graduated at a certain point to doing more than just ordinary hypnotherapy because I ended up doing some exorcisms. And I mean, a number of them. And that was because, you know, I, I came across some unusual things in some hypnotherapy cases that were really troubling. And, but I don't want to get into all that detail, but the, the point is, is that I had this years and years and years of experience and reading and dealing with actually evil, because when you, when you deal with, with, uh, an exorcism, and, and in some cases, it's, it really is an exorcism. Right. Um, most cases, it's just, you know, detaching a dead dude who, uh, you know, didn't know what to do after he died, and you just help him along on his way. You know, basically, it was like psychologically counseling, uh, you know, somebody who's in the afterlife. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you encounter some, some attachment with some person and they're there because, well, you know, I died as a result of rape and I never got a chance to confess and therefore, you know, I'm a sinner and I can't go to heaven, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah. So you basically take them through a whole theology lesson and explain to them, you know, why God wouldn't be condemning them if you don't want to think, just to tell them there is, you know, God the way they think of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I had a lot of experience, and I could see, I, I I developed really good nose for, you know, bullshit and and evil, and uh, and I'll tell you, there was one exorcism I did. It took me six months to recover. I mean, literally, I mean, it was just like, you know, you feel like you're, you're psychologically, like your, your, your skin has been flayed off of you, you know, and that, that all, all your meat is raw and exposed. Um, but, uh, yeah, the new age movement and all of that sort of thing was coming along and I was reading about it, reading all this channeling and it, Meanwhile, I'd been doing all this work in the background. And, you know, the thing was, was during all of this time, I tried to understand what I was reading and experiencing and tried to formulate a theory to explain it. And the best theory I had ever come up with was, well, it's all mind. I mean, there's a case that Joel Whitten writes about in his book, and he's a Canadian psychiatrist not a psychologist. And there was a case where he had a, a patient who uh, would have these horrible physiological effects at periodic intervals. And then she started, you know, things started happening in her house. Was, she had a dollhouse or something and the dollhouse kept being covered with blood and there would be blood on the walls and that sort of thing. Well, they took samples of it. It was human blood. So, but she, you know, wasn't bleeding from any right. place. And to make a long story short, uh, he did a bunch of hypnotherapy with her and took her into past life experiences. And she had been killed, apparently, with her child. And I, and if I'm not remembering this story exactly, that's all right. It's, it's, the point is still going to carry. And in a past life, and that she had all this grief. And so that every... Uh, at the, at the age that she was when she died in the previous life is when this phenomena began in this life. Wow. And, uh, I, I don't remember exactly if it was like every month when she had her period or if it was related to special events. I don't remember that exactly. But the thing was, was that once he processed her trauma, the phenomena stopped. You know, and I mean, it's very similar to poltergeist phenomena, you know, because that's always associated with sexually frustrated women or, you know, adolescents, you know, or pre -pre prepubescent or just pubescent uh, young people, mostly female, but sometimes male. So, 
Uh, and then there was one famous poltergeist case. Uh, the young, lady, young girl, I think she was in Miami. I think she ended up committing murder, and it was a real tragic situation. I don't remember her name right up hand. But the uh, psychologist, professor uh, who, who worked on that case wrote a book about it. And he had the idea that there were all these emotional impulses and feelings and so forth in the body that would, you know, generate and rise up and that they would divert at the back of the neck somewhere. They wouldn't make it up to the brain where they could be uh, dealt with. They would, they would just randomly just shoot out, you know, energy shooting out your neck, so to speak. That's awesome. That's pretty interesting. And so my idea was that everything was mind. And in a sense, it is. But we still have to, you know, we are not at the level yet where that makes any practical sense for us, nor is it of any practical use to say that we're all one because we are not at that level yet. Yes. Uh, so I had the idea, it's all mind and um, all this phenomena, it's all mind, you know, da da da. And then the whole thing about the UFO thing came up, you know, because then I started the channeling experiment. And we don't even like to call it channeling because it's not even really channeling because nobody is unconscious. Nobody is doing anything weird, you know. Uh, we do it, you know, full light, you know, with a room full of people, everybody talking and chatting. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not your usual. We just call it superluminal communication because we're right. communicating with ourselves. And, and we'll come back to that, so don't get excited. Uh, yeah, so... I had started the experiment and the guy that, and, and it was a whole synchronous series of events that I even met this guy, but that's neither here nor there uh, at the moment because he started on UFOs and aliens. He says, what the heck? <laughs> Wait, that is where I drew my line. I, I had been researching the paranormal and you know, there was a lot of credible witnesses, and I read all of these, you know, proceedings of the, re uh, the Psychical Research Society and scientific, you know, was, uh, talks about it and and articles and books written by doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists, you know, people who had reputations, you know, and, and I have a theory. But UFOs and aliens? Ah, and that was, that was my line. Yeah, I mean, I could accept the paranormal. I could formulate a theory about it, you know, that, you know, kind of made sense. And I could deal with it, work with it, talk about it. But do not talk to me about UFOs and aliens. And that's all he wanted to talk about. So he talked to talk. So anyway, to make a long story short, shorter, um, I ended up being bedridden. This happens to me frequently during my life. Um, and he brought over a paper bag full, a grocery bag, you know, full of paperback books about UFOs and aliens. Yeah. So I picked one of them, and it happened to be a Bud Hopkins book. So I read Bud Hopkins, and, and I just think, oh, God. Uh, what the heck is going on? Because he sounded like he was a rational person, you know. He didn't. I mean, my idea of somebody who's interested in UFOs, you know, they had coke bottle glasses and they had Mad Magazine rolled up in their pocket, <laughs> yeah. plastic pen protector in their pocket, that that sort of thing. That's that's the person who's interested in UFOs. And uh, but Bud Hopkins was, you know, he wrote a very interesting book. So there, but there was a whole sack full. So I ran through all of them and I read and read and read and read. And I said, wow. wow. At the end of it, I said, the only thing I can say is just, there's a whole heck of a lot of smoke. You know, is there a fire? Right. And then, no sooner had this little episode passed than. You know, my my daughter picked some numbers for her uh, weekly lottery. It wasn't the big weekend one, but anyhow, she went, we went about 35000 on her pick. And I said, well, okay, and, you know, I'm going to get us the swimming pools for the kids and for me to have some therapy because I need therapy. And by the way, you know, the, the, these like, above-ground swimming pools are great for aqua therapy. 
And we have a big in-ground spring-fed pool out back. But we also have, <laughs> we have our baby pool, my, my above-ground pool that I do my, my, my aqua gym. So I got this pool and we got it all set up. And then the first night that we're, you know, going to get in the pool and it was August, uh, August 17th or 18th. And we're going to go and float in the pool and watch the Perseid meteor shower. And we're out there in the pool, Newport Ritchie backyard. And all of a sudden my kid says, wow, what is that? Look. And I turned around and I look and there's this, enormous black boomerang, boomerang yeah. sailing over the top of my house. I mean, utterly silent, really close. I don't think it was any higher than, um, I really don't think it was any higher than 150 feet from the ground. I mean, it was yeah. just about the top of the house. If you'd been standing on the roof of the house, two-story house with a broom, you could have touched it now. Just, just FYI, I've seen them myself too in California, in Southern California, three times and one time with my daughter. So, me being with that, whatever that means. Yeah, and it's it. If anything, you don't really hear anything, but you feel yes. like a rumble. Yes. And you don't really see redness, but you perceive a dull red glow to the blackness of it. So I went over, and then a few minutes later, another one went over. And I mean, it was moving as slow as, as you could walk. I mean, really slow. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'd been jogging, I could have kept up with it. Mm -hmm. And so that freaked me out. I was thinking something that size, that shape, you know, they, they really need a little velocity to stay airborne. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing that occurred to me. Well, anyway, so my brain is working really, really hard to try to figure out what I just saw and it fit into no category. So I decided what I saw must have been a flock of geese <laughs> that were flying <laughs> in formation really close together so that you couldn't see the sky between their bodies. That was, right. my, oh, right. that was what my brain came up with. How, all, all of your children saw it? Everyone that was in the backyard saw it too? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and they remember it to this day. So the thing was, was that the next thing was, was there was a, a, another sighting up at Pine Island, which is north of Arapico, which is north of Hudson, north of Newport Ridge, north of Tampa. You know, to check it out. It's a really nice place. Uh, the, there was a sighting there, which is, you know, it's a long, lonely road that goes, I mean, it just runs on like a, a bank, you know, through the marshes. And it gets out to this little island-like place, which is like, uh, it's a park now, back, way back when. It was just raw nature. And uh, a family of five and a sheriff's deputy wow. saw their club. Turned in, so there was an article in the newspaper. And then it turned out that the sheriff's deputy happened to be somebody to school with. When you live in a certain area, you know everybody, right? Yeah. Well, and I just thought, you know, that that was really weird that, uh, and that that came up. And then a little later, there was, um, I met a woman. The circumstances aren't really important. And we got to talking about hypnotherapy. And she says, well, you know, something happened to me weird, yes, however many years before. And I always wanted, wanted to know what happened. You think you could help me find out? And I says, well, sure, we can try. So she was, she had an appointment. She was coming over and it started to storm like crazy. And you know, sudden thunderstorms and storm, like this was a really, really wild one. And I thought, well, she won't come in this kind of weather, but she had started up from Spring Hill. It was a long way. So she was already part way to my house before it started raining. So she came on. And she came in and did this, um, did the hypnotherapy and so on and so forth. And, and the bizarre thing was I hadn't said anything to her about, about any aliens or abductions or anything like that. And here she started presenting me, you know, questions and answers. I was asking questions. She was answering, presenting me with 
a classic missing time case, you know, a la Betty and Barney Hill. Right. Or, you know, or some of the people in the Bud Hopkins books. And I said, well, oh, this is weird, you know. And we got to the point where she was, and I was taking her through it step by step. Okay, you've, you know, she pulled off the, off the road because this big blue light was just like getting bigger and bigger. And so she pulled off the road and I said, okay, what's happening now? I'm sitting in my car. I says, what's happening now? She says, there's somebody outside. I says, what's happening now? And then she started, you know, really getting agitated and doing like this and, uh, and carrying on. And I said, what's the matter? And she says, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And I says, what do you mean it hurts? She says, you know, my hands, my arms are there, you know, they hurt, they hurt. And I, so I backed her up and I started over again. I okay? pulled off the coat, side of the side of the road, in the car. You're sitting there. What's happening now? I'm holding the steering wheel. And like, what's happening now? There's some, something is outside. What is it? And then she starts hurting again. And so I tried a split screen technique, which, you know, generally can get anybody to reveal anything, even if it's traumatic, because you, you take the person out of it being immediately in it. You suggest that they are looking at a movie or a TV screen or whatever, and they're seeing it happen to somebody else even you know, to take them away from it so that the trauma doesn't bother them. And she couldn't even do it then. I never saw anything like that. I was getting the creeps. So I asked her, I says, why can't she tell me? And she said, they won't let me. Okay. Fast forward. A couple of days, newspaper article, St. Pete Times. There was a UFO sighting that night, and it just happened to be, you know, I mean, we figured it out because the person who sighted it was in her house, and it was like three or four or five blocks down the, down the way, and she was looking in the direction of, you know, where I lived, and she described what she saw in the time she saw, and it turned out that what she saw was one of these big black boomerangs over my house at the exact time I was doing this hypnosis session with this wow. So, you know, things were getting a little weird. And uh, so I was involved in the AOL discussions and I had, you know, finally got the Cassie Pins uh, communication and was talking about that on, on AOL and on the uh, several newsletter distributions. One of them was, uh, was somebody, Colonel Stevens or somebody, he was very uh, influential in the UFO community at the time. He's dead now. And uh, um, I sent him some of the transcripts and he sent me an email back privately. And he says, you know, I've never seen anything like this before. He says, this, this is the closest to what we know that I've ever seen. And I thought, uh, comforting because <laughs> one of the things why are they talking to me right it's so, yeah some of the thing, things that they say are not happy making right and uh, so I went on and I realized that there was there was this big to do about the Heaven's Gate cult and their mass suicide because they expected to be taken up with the hail bop cometers or some nonsense like that. And the weird thing was, was on the days that that happened before, starting from before it happened and lasting for probably 24 hours or something, you know, we had a little website where we were putting up some of the material at that time. We started getting hit that just went off the chart. And probably 50% of them were from Boeing. Wow. Yeah. What the heck? So I don't know why Boeing, but that's what it was. And so, yeah, I realized that there are people that are they are the new ages that expect the, the aliens that are going to come save them. And they're, they're you know, they're so wonderful. And they put me back in bed and pulled my blanket out and gave me my binky. And I'm in. 
they're, you know, so they must love me. And well, you know, whatever, you know, there's stuff to learn. And, <laughs> and, and, and then I even did some hypnosis sessions with some new agey types, and they just, you know, I've, I've included some of those sessions excerpts so some of them are fairly lengthy in the in the wage series so yeah either you know when i started getting some of that material and uh i just you know i realized that, that that somebody's somebody needs to really put all this together and write about it and let people know that maybe it's not such a friendly phenomenon after all you know because i mean there are cattle mutilations so there was material going around about human mutilations. I don't know if you've looked at the human mutilation material. Yeah. yeah. And there was information about, you know, airplanes that disappeared. It, it, I think there was even, I don't know what all the detail was, but there were planes that disappeared and pilots that disappeared and, um, you know, threatening acts that were made against military installations. And, you know, a lot of it was covered up, but there, you know, things came out. So I said, you know, I really need to put this together because I would like to convince people that this is not because one of the, of the things we had learned from the seas was that it was a hyperdimensional phenomenon. And I said, you know, all these people, they're looking for the UFO Cadillac to land on the White House lawn where they can walk up to it and kick its tires. And uh, it's not going to happen that way. It isn't that way. And people that talk about, you know, yeah, you know, the like for example, the reptoids or the dracom dracominoids or whatever you want to call. We just call them lizzies because it's easy, yeah. you know. And in, in, Flor in Florida, they're upright alligators. Yeah. And supposedly they are denizens of fourth density, not dimension, but density. And density is a concept that was brought up and dictated in great detail in the raw material. In there, right. Which is right. really, really good. I mean, you should really check. Uh, sometimes it's hard to read, but it's worth it. I have the whole black super feature set from like 10 years ago where they put them all together and glossed them. <laughs> Okay, well then you should be rating it. You haven't already. No, I have. I have. I have. It's good, great info in there. But you're right; it's very tedious at places. It's it's extremely dense. Yeah. So, I um, I decided it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. And I started writing, and I wrote a chapter almost every day. Wow. I mean, we're talking about getting up and starting at seven o'clock in the morning. My kids brought me sandwiches and coffee to my desk, you know, feed mom. And I would write until nine or 10 o'clock at night. And then I would get it done and I would put it up. Maybe the next day I had to go back and correct some errors because readers would send me, well, you, you misspelled this or you forgot, to, you know, whatever. When was this? This was in the early nine, early to mid nineties when you were uh, writing these? No, 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 this is in... 19, I think I was writing it in 99, 2000. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I was, you know, I mean, I was writing it before 9-11. I mean, right. because you don't see any reference to 9-11 in there. So I'm pretty sure it was finished before, um, 9-11 before 2001. And of course, meanwhile, I had this what do you call, reporter and his photographer sidekick, you know, camping out at my house half the time. And I mean, for the amount of interviews they did, you know, he only got 20 pages. <laughs> I mean, they practically lived at my house for two or three years. Um, yeah. I had that going on in the background. And so I wrote the wave and I wrote it, you know, in a state of almost, you know, almost frenzy. You know, they talk about the, uh, the old days of the, uh, the oracles 
in Greece, you know, and they would, uh, they would go and they would go into some kind of frenzy. Yeah. And pronounce, uh, well, I was practically in a frenzy because some of the kids couldn't even talk to me. You know, I, I was just, and a weird phenomena was happening all over the place, you know, thumps and bumps and bangs and things falling and toothpaste and toothbrushes appearing and disappearing, which is really annoying. What, what did you feel like in this, in that state? Because to me, it's an, I'm imagining you were kind of driven by spirit, your higher self, higher density, whatever you want to call it. Is that is that kind of the best way to liken it to? Yeah, because I was definitely, I was dr dr driven. I was like, uh, I mean, how would you say it was, hon? What? When I was riding the wave. He, 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 he said I was in a trance. <laughs> So that's what it would make. That's, that's exactly how it would make sense. Because if you're receiving, like you said, super luminal communication or downloads, that's the only way they would be able to get it to you probably. Yeah. And by this time we'd been doing the seas for probably about four, five, six years going, you know, something like that. So, I mean, it, at that point it was like almost, you know, I never could, and I, and I still don't to this day, know what they're going to say before they say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we spell it out with a planchette. And I write it out one letter at a time. So everything, every bit of the communication is one letter. I mean, there's probably a million of them, but it was one at a time. And I never know. It bypasses my conscious mind. And... It's usually a surprise. And if I think with well, get a couple of letters going and I think I know what the word's going to be, because, you know, it's like playing Jeopardy. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, I was like, and I think I know what it's going to be. And then it turns out to be something different. You know, it always freaks me out, but they, but they do that. So I thought this is something, something has to be done to, to clarify this. And I wanted to present the dangers of the New Age movement, the dangers of UFOs and aliens because they pose a clear and present danger to humanity. And I wanted to provide the evidence that I had collected, and that was quite a bit, that this was a hyperdimensional phenomenon. And if you're looking for uh, something that's going to be solid 3D and they, they came from, uh, you know, some planet from some other star system you know that may or may not be true but they didn't come necessarily as as three-dimensional or third density individuals so it's not it, it's not a pleasant thing and of course the more i collected the data and the more i wrote the more i understood that you know what charles Fort said is yeah it's very true we are property and it's not a pleasant thing to think about. And so that is the whole thing behind the writing of the wave. It was written in a, in a, in a state, an altered state almost. Um, and it went on from, it went on for months. I mean, obviously it went on a chapter a day. You figure out how many there are. I, I might have taken a day off here and there, but you know, not much. And, uh, I would. Just, I was driven and no sooner did I get one page finished as I was finishing, as I was writing it, I knew what I had to write in the next one. So I, no sooner was one finished than, you know, the next one was already writing itself in my head. So that's how you got the wave and the wave is. In, in addition to the insights from the skis and whatever channeling I might have been doing on, you know, there in, during the writing, there is also a tremendous amount of information that has been extracted from uh, an enormous number of books. And, you know, there's stuff that there are insights that came from books that I didn't even quote from directly or mention. But, you know, I read thousands and thousands. Of, yeah. I read what, what, once I had experience with this crazy damn UFO over my house and I realized that it, it, 
clearly was not just something that, you know, was an imagination. It wasn't imagination. I mean, incidentally, not long after that, my dog died. You know, you know he got sick and died, and I was suffering from something that was similar to radiation poisoning. Kids were sick and had problems. Or, you know, it wasn't a pleasant experience. So, yeah, I wanted to convey to people that the New Age movement is just a new version of, of you know, snake oil sales. The same old song and dance. Yeah, it's 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 snake oil, and most of it is, and I and is just useless if not downright dangerous, and. That it is a hyperdimensional phenomenon, and to explain to people how this phenomenon affects them. I mean, this is not just something that happens to somebody over there. This is not just, you know, some UFO and some aliens and some abductee. Everybody can be affected by this because I, and then I wrote an article at one point called Aliens, Demons, and Vampires, something like that. And I was comparing the group. Uh, historical uh, information about so-called demonic possession and vampires to you know, what so-called aliens do. Right. And, you know, calling them aliens, well, well, they're alien to us, because, but they're not necessarily from somewhere else. They're from another density. You know? Right. It's complete, right. completely different. I mean, those density those dimensions can be rolled up all around us. And, and one of the reasons why, uh, why they don't come in and take us over is because they are fork density and they right. can't, you know, they can't maintain themselves in our density for any length of time. Now the seeds say that the men in black are reptilians. They're Lizzie's that have been, you know, transformed themselves into, you know, human like uh, forms and they, you know, appear and, and they can maintain this for a limited period of time. But if you read all of the literature on men in black, they are really weird. Have, have you, I know they are. Have you ever seen, I'm sure you have, but have you ever seen Dan Aykroyd's interview when he was approached by a man in black? No. It's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. Assuming you believe uh, Dan uh, Aykroyd. Does he talk about how they run down and they start stuttering because they can't because they're running out of gas or whatever? Well, so they yeah. So so this guy, one of them again, again, if you believe Dan Aykroyd, and I I find him credible. I mean, it's hard to find anyone in Hollywood credible, but the reality is is that he seemingly is credible, especially in this interview. You can find it on YouTube. I you know the, let the the crew look it up, watch it. But he says that they get, they knocked on his door. Oh, and yeah. they were asking him, yeah, they they asked him a bunch of questions. Oh, yeah. And and it was bizarre. Like one of them didn't have like an earlobe, you know, it was like missing. And then, you know, it looked like he had white makeup all over, very translucent white skin. And he yeah. said it was just the most bizarre thing because as he was talking to them, he felt like he was in sort of a trance because he was like he couldn't understand why he didn't feel balanced. So it was almost like, I guess, as you say in the books with the Cassiopeians uh information that it's it's like a, a what do you call it, a window falling or something like that where you're with another being from another uh, a higher density in your density. I, I don't know. It was, it, understanding the way I understand things now from your information, it makes a lot more sense now. That would actually be a really good video to to queue up and to watch that interview with him again because it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, a a lot of literature on it. So, um, yeah. So hyperdimensional, that's, that was the thing. And when I wrote the book, Secret History, I also wanted to, I mean, that book was kind of like a dump. You know, I dumped everything I had, you know, pulled together up to that moment in that book because I was under so much attack at the time. I thought, well, you know, they're going to kill me. I mean, they are going to kill me. Do you know, the, just so you know, Hunter and I read that book two years ago. Laura and honestly, it blew our brains apart so much that we literally didn't know what to do with it. We were like, <laughs> "Well, it's funny because we actually said I don't know if dump was the exact word, but we said we had felt like the same thing that you had all this information and you just didn't have any outlet for it, so you got it in there because I would read it and I would be fascinated, and I would felt like I would jump around into the next thing, and it was so overwhelming. Now I wish I had read the wave before it 
because right. it makes so much more sense in right. hindsight. But I don't, I don't even remember how we found the book. We were like, we got to read. No, we it. found it off of Amazon. It, it, we found it off of Amazon. I remember telling you, dude, it was a review. Yeah. Somebody wrote a review and said, if you think this is interesting, you need to read LKJ. So I was like, what? And then I well, found it. Was, it. it was funny because she was the first person that talked about, and I don't want to get into like name calling or anything, but she was the first person that talked about Stephen Greer potentially being COINTEL Pro. And Jay and I in private had talked about that for years because Jay had met him in person yeah. and it felt that he had been replaced or something like that, something <laughs> weird from where he had known him before to where he was. And show the book. I remember, yeah. Go ahead. Show the book. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's front of the book. I have so, it's so many highlighted sections in this book. <laughs> it's a monster. It's a true I Bible. Well, true story about Stephen Greer, just really quick, because I think it's fascinating. I want to tell uh, you the picture in just a second. Show the cover. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. You got to show the like right in the center because it's cutting. It. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, those are photographs I took in Osh Cathedral, which is about 50 kilometers over to the uh, west, west of us. Yeah. Yeah. So I took those pictures, and they're important. Uh, for later reasons, but continue on Hunter. Well, so, so Greer, I met, I went to a thing. I was fascinated by his work. This is a long time ago. Now this is at the very beginning of his work, you know, or not the beginning of his work, because we all know that he was supposed to have that thing before nine 11 happened and it never happened, but this was around 2008 or 2009 in Southern California. And he was showing, he was appearing at some speech in uh, Glendale and I lived in Pasadena. So my, at the time, uh, my ex, my ex-wife, Ann and I went to visit him, and I met with him. And this is a crazy story, but he locked his, he locked himself out of his rental car, in the underground parking garage, where it was. And he was cool. talking, and he was like, "Oh my god, I can't get my keys." And I said, "You know what? I actually have a slim gym in my car. Let me go with you. Now we can get it out." And he was like, "Oh, would you?" He's, and so I went with him, and we had this, you know, 20, 25 minute conversation while we were uh, slim gymming him. It could, it ended up being, the, it was one of those rental cars that you couldn't slim Jim. And so he ended up calling, or it was actually, I ended up calling my AAA people and they came out and got him in, but him and I were just having a conversation. And I would swear to you, he was such a good man. He was such a nice, humble, decent. Huh? And, and again, obviously this is before I understood the hyperdimensional aspects of this as I do now, but it was just like, I could never think that he would be a COINTEL pro. And then now you look at the guy and I just watched him do an interview. Hunter and I watched him do an interview with Billy Carson. Billy's a good friend of mine about a year ago. And we were like, this guy is gone. He's not even there. Like, who is that guy? Well, the thing is, is that when you have, you know, go back to the thing about what vampires can do. Right. You know, they can control your mind. They can control the weather. They can control animals. They can change forms. They can pass yes. through walls. They can right. walk up the side cliffs or walls or whatever. You know, these are the abilities that have been described in terms of, you know, alien visitors, so to speak. Sure. The, the part about controlling minds is really important. You know, I mean, Count Dracula's guilt, you know, come, come right, 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 right. And they don't really have to even go to that extent because they can do it. They're invisible. They can be invisible and they can be controlling your mind. And I even had, you know, some kind of like a flash of, of an image once, you know, of some, you know, lizard type being, you know, sitting in front of a big console with, you know, buttons and levers and dials and little camera images of all these people that he was in charge of controlling. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I, let me let me bump up his emotional state right now. He pushes the lever and the guy starts going, to, you know, you know, let me let me put let me throw a little sex spin on that. He's gonna. Have, <laughs> He's going to have a, a, a sudden attraction to this person or, you know, let me, you know, whatever. Uh, he's going to punch somebody out or he's going to think that his wife is on Facebook or he's going to, you know, and that they're out right. there. This, and, you know, it's not that far from the truth. It's not. It's not. That's the scary thing. And that's why you have to, that's why, you know, getting acquainted with and controlling your own mind and your own emotions is like probably the first step to becoming free of this hyperdimensional control matrix. Right. You know, that's the act of kind of like, you know, taking the red pill. 
And so, yeah. Anyway, carry on. <clears throat> well, I was going to say ahead. with see with secret history of the world. And I thought this was cool in the wave series too. So on the one hand, Jay and I have read a lot of quote unquote channeled work. And it, a lot of it is some, some good. You can look at like Barbara Marciniak and some of these things. And there's like probably truth with error, but what was cool about the wave is like you said, there was the channeled material, whatever you want to call it. But then there was also this concrete data that you would have thousands of footnotes per book that you, then you could go and look at and say, okay, this lines up, you know, for instance, you could look at, um, I always mispronounce the name, but Gurchev or more of F and go cite, okay, this was going on at this time in human consciousness. This is going on in this time. And there's a through line, even though we use maybe different like language concepts to describe it, that's going on. And then <clears throat> going back to like looking some of the highlights I have in secret history of the world, it starts to make a lot more sense of trying to grab and understand why has humanity been under this yoke for so long of like, I feel like 95% of people want to do the right thing. They just want to pay their bills and provide for their family. But why is there's this narrative of just human suffering and destruction for so long? Is it psychopaths? But then who's controlling the psychopaths? So it made a lot more sense after I read the wave of like the through lines and secret history of why humanity seemed to be under this like yoke of manipulation and control for so long. Yeah, it's a it's a repeating syndrome, and by the way, it's probably more like eighty seven percent, and maybe even not that because you know there's like seventy percent that are psychopaths, and they're you know surrounding minions or people with related pathologies that interact with them, and then then you have like a bell curve, you know, of people. Uh, you know, the other 87 percent is a bell curve, and you divide it in half of them. And one side of them are the people that are going in the, you know, going the down path. And then the other side are going the up path. So, you know, and there's even a worse problem about that, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> so yeah. one of your questions actually would my, be. My head, I have so many, I mean, my head is exploding right now. This is so amazing. I'm so grateful that you're doing this. Yeah. Um, what do you think about just getting back into the channeling aspect? And I, and I know what the CDs have said. What about Dolores Cannon? Is that all nonsense? Dolores Cannon. Uh, you want to give me a second here to... Yeah, of course. To pull up my C's transcript search engine. Dolores. She seems like a good soul, but I was reading some of her books and I just told Hunter, I would just throw the book on the ground and say, this is abject nonsense. Well, here's the thing too, while Laura's looking that up, that now that I understand anyone that knowingly or unknowingly says the alien phenomenon has any sort of benefit to humanity now. Right, can't be. Because again, you interchange the word alien with vampire, with demon. It's a modern construct of the same language that's been used. And so I would say anyone that would quote unquote call that friendly and benevolent and then right. also, too, will create an external savior complex around these beings. The space brothers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, even if there's some truth in there that would resonate, it, it probably more or less is used. It as, seems like it's COINTELPRO to the hilt, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, I didn't have anything on Dolores, so I didn't find anything. I don't think we ever mentioned her, but I think we talked about her a few times. And I th I'm pretty sure there's an, a thread on her on our forum where she's been discussed and some of her work has been, you know, but let me say this, there are some excellent psychics in this world. You For know, sure. You know, you're at your ordinary psychic who's clairvoyant or uh, even somewhat telepathic and can tell you things, uh, foretell things about you in specific and, um, you know, some really good ones. And I have encountered a couple of the superior psychics, absolutely superior. And they were just so filled. The two of them were the older ladies at the time. I was, I'm the old lady now, but back then <laughs> I was a young one and they were older, you know, but they just had this, this luminescent glow, their faces, you know, it's like they were filled with light. And they told me some things that were extremely accurate on fur. For my entire life, even up to now, there were things that they were telling me. But yeah, so 
I don't in any way denigrate. So I, there are people who have um, powers, you know, to to do certain things. Some people are able to uh, effect healings. Some people, you know, can do a lot of different things. And of course, you know, I I was really fascinated reading about some of the earlier mediums, you know, the, the ones that that would produce ectoplasmic things. Yeah, well, there are photographs of those things, you know. And to me, I mean, like you say, if you have Palladino, well, there's 15 pounds after a session of producing ectoplasm. Unreal. And, you know, and it's, and Daniel Dunglass Home, my husband and I, were, he's been reading about Daniel Dunglass Home. And he, uh, he's pretty fascinated with this. And so we talk about it. And I says, well, you know, uh, it partly sounds like poltergeist phenomena, but more than anything, it sounds to me like what he was experiencing was interactions with hyperdimensional, like fourth density beings, and they were behaving in, in the manner of a trickster. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, you know, there's other, otherwise, because, you know, he's agonizing over it. How do I explain this with physics? You know, yeah. thinking, I don't think you have to. All you got to do is understand fourth density, and then it's all explained. Yeah. Let me ask. Let me ask you a question around that around the Anunnaki. Now, a great mentor of mine, Gerald Clark, who's now dead, who wrote a couple books on the Anunnaki, and was Gerald was an amazing. Um, you know, he's kind of like Ark. He he had like thirty seven patents and in, uh, integrated circuits. He he ended up walking away from society. He was living in the jungle in Mexico. Uh, his story is insane. What happened to him with his ex and his, he had a, he had a down syndrome child and he wanted that he wanted to let him live out his life. And his ex, you know, was all into the system and making sure he was attached to the system and all that stuff. Anyway, he lost all of his money that he had made and he had made significant amount of money. And he was eventually just living in a, uh, like a, not, not a TP, but just a living year. off the land in Mexico. But he w would tell me stories about these beings, yeah. you know, and that, whatever they were, you know, he was always not speaking in the same ways of densities, but that they were higher, uh, realm, you know, beings and that they had intellects that were 20 to 30 times the smartest third density human. Right. And that they could just literally conjure a thought before you thought it, they knew your thought before you thought it, but he, we would have these conversations who and I know it's an opinion question, and I know the C's have probably answered it many times before, but were the Anunnaki stolen as far as like the actual mythos of this builder race that came here on this planet, whatever, however many long ago, by the quote-unquote fourth density reptoids or dracomoids, or were they actually, you know, a fourth density giant humanoids? I mean, who were the Anunnaki? Do we, do we really know who they were? Hold on, I've got nine references one of the questions on the list is in many of the sumerian drawings and literature the gods the anunnaki are described as eating a plant that grew at the bottom of the ocean and this plant was the source of eternal life answer nonsense the source of eternal life is existence well the point was this is me that there was some sort of food that these beings ate that was unusual or different that somehow enhanced their abilities to an extreme degree. Answer. Totally false, and you should know it. All so-called special powers come from non-physical sources. Okay, next hit. How did the people of that planet come to Earth? Did they know it was going to be destroyed? And here we're talking about Cantec. You know about Cantec, right? Cantec, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where the white race Cantecians. Uh, so how did the people of that planet come to earth? Did they know it was going to be destroyed? Some knew and were taken by Lizzie's and they are the Anunnaki. Okay. So they, meaning the Kentuckians or the, or the lizards were the Anunnaki. I don't know. That, that, if that's ambiguous, let's see what the next hit is. Well, so, okay, go ahead. Give me the next hit because this, this falls in with Shane Bales. Here I ask directly, who were the Anunnaki? Aliens. Where were they from? Zeta Reticuli. Do they come here every time a comet cluster is approaching to sap soul's energy created by fear and chaos? Yes. Are the two events loosely interrelated? Yes. Is that why they are here now? 
closed. Is there a large fleet of spaceships riding a wave, so to speak, approaching our planet? Yes. Where are these ships from? Zeta Reticuli. When will they arrive? One month, 18 years or longer. <laughs> How can there be such a vast discrepancy in time? This is such a huge fleet that space-time space warping is irregular and difficult to determine as you measure time. Next tip. So are they humanoid? Well, if I remember correct, I think that transcript, it goes on to say there's 36 million of them in or ships. That, yeah, the Nephilim. Yeah. yeah, that's the Nephilim. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a, okay. That was different. Anunnaki, aliens. So yeah. I'm assuming that that means the Anunnaki were Lizzie's. Yeah, it has to be. If you put those that together with. So, that's what she, so that's, so there's a guy by the name of Shane Bales. And, and, you may, and maybe you're familiar with him. And if you're not, I'm going to send you an email tonight to read his website. But that is mind blowing because he has been saying that the Anunnaki are the reptoids, the, the Dracomoids, and that they actually impersonated a lot of the information that is found in the, the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian stuff about the builders. And that because because and that's a question I have for you now, too. You might as well just answer it or you, you can answer it. But. Because you talk about the fourth density consortium consisting of dracomoids, greys, and, and, and giant humanoids. Would those fourth density consortium humanoids be the builder race from way before the dracomoids? Well, hold on. Because you talk about the Celts. Okay, I've got 108 references to the control. <laughs> So I don't think we want to go through all of that. <laughs> I remember, it, yeah, it was a large part of it is third density humans that are involved with interacting with uh, their alien overlords. And I would suppose that some of them, I mean, remember what they said about um, the, the tall blonde yeah. uh, types, you know, that they, the Nordics, the Nordics can be either bad guys or the good guys. So that's the right. only thing that are, of good guys, that there are any good guys among is, is the, the Nordics. And um, yeah, so I would say, and, and you got to be clear on this because there are the Nordics, they're tall box, there the uh, are the Anunnaki, which is the lizards, there are the lizards, the lizards. there are the great aliens, which are cyber genetic probes, you know, they just, right. they, they, they grow like plants. And then there's, um, you know, there are a variety of other types, you know, I mean, I've got some kind of little books that I thought was pretty reliable that presented some different types and the cities say there are some different types. So, but amongst them all, uh, the Nephilim remember are third density right. beings. And they are really, what they say, they were 14 feet tall and... Some taller, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, was, it was like, it was a really funny session when we did that. Well, you know, so, so interesting enough, there's a lot of remnants of them that have been wiped off by the Smithsonian. Oh, you know, yeah. Like, if know. you read books about giants and right. you see that, and, and I've got one and he's got reproduced in there. The newspaper articles that were yeah, yeah. about these finds, yeah, you know, and then the Smithsonian all of a sudden says, "Oops, no, we don't know Oof. anything about it. If it was here, we don't know anything. It, it disappeared." And yet there are credible eyewitnesses, and that's that's what I'm always looking for is you know credible eyewitnesses, and they're credible. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So, yeah, right. there was some remnants of that, and it was mostly in the Americas, but there's also been some found in. And, uh, uh, Central Asia and in the, in the Anatolian areas and so forth. So, and of course, along with that, you, you, you look for the weird skulls, you know, the, you know, with, well, the serpent, the serpent mound in Ohio, I've been to that. And that's like one of the great, amazing, you know, unexplained phenomena slash of Ohio or whatever, but there's also a giant meteor crater you know, in that area or, you know, in that field. And so a lot of people hypothesize that that was probably the Nephilim ship. 
Probably not. It was more likely to be a meteoroid or a meteorite. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if it's an actual crater, it would be something that actually hit. You know, the, uh, when they explode overhead, they make these elongated, um, you know, areas of ablation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, and that's the other thing. That's, that's the other big theme that the seas brought out was uh, disasters and cataclysms brought on by uh, cometary bombardment or meteorite bombardment and so forth. So, and it's somehow that the, that's loosely interrelated with, you know, the appearance and, you know, of aliens and, and their direct interaction with humanity. And they also say that that's somehow interrelated with the wave that the, uh, the comets, whatever they are, are this time, you know, riding the wave that they will uh, arrive in a way that is something, you know, like maybe appearing from fourth density to third. I don't know. That would be pretty scary, but I've done a whole lot of work on, uh, cataclysmic disruptions in the past, a lot of research and, uh, yeah. So that's things are, you know, things change. And when you have macrocosmic changes, uh, and even a change in density, it's not going to be, you know, peaceful. Yeah. It's going to be chaotic and it's going to be, um, disruptive and destructive. And, uh, yeah, and that's the way it's always been. I mean, the world doesn't end. Right. It takes a beating. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Would you say too, Laura, this is one question I, you've, you've talked about it, but I've wondered is the weather and these cataclysmic events remnants or reverberations of fourth density, maybe not warfare, but energetic things happening and it's our attempt to kind of describe them and say what happens kind of the same way that like if dogs heard a domestic violence dispute next door, they would probably have a different way to describe it than a human would describe like, Oh, my neighbors are fighting, but a dog would say like, this could be some like meteoric shift or something like that. Cause I don't know what is next door or who's talking or whatever. So is that what we're witnessing when we see that? Or is it just actual nature, you know, random events that happen? That's a great analogy. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the seas have said that the weather and earth changes are reflections of battles in fourth density. Yeah. And that, uh, and sometimes you can even notice it. I mean, you, you can, if you, we've had a number of meetings where we got together with a bunch of people, we had some plans to do some interesting things and there would be the sudden violent storms, you know, as though, you know, no, you're not going to do that. You know, we won't let you. And then, you know, there was, there have been floods. And so it's all related. And the fact that there's an increasing number of these things of floods and, and earthquakes and, and of course, war itself. I mean, the ancients had a great idea because for them, war was a God thing, you know, you, you, you and your God and uh, this, these people and their God, you know, you were fighting on behalf of the God. And in a way, it's true. I mean, if you know about egregores, you know, people, right. people get under the influence of an egregore and they'll do anything that it, that it drives them to do. I mean, look at, look at the Ukrainians. They've got a, they've got a horrendous egregore driving them. And uh, so it's just, Wars, earth changes, all kinds of things. And I, I want to say something else here that, you know, a lot of people are not happy with me when I say this, but I know that there is spraying going on. They're spraying all kinds of crap on people. Of course. But you know what? There is something else going on up in the sky that people are not talking about that they should be, which is the changes in the stratosphere. And I mean, extreme icing, extreme cold in the stratosphere, which causes contrails, not chemtrails. Chemtrails, yeah. Chemtrails are lower because think about it this way. If you're going to drop some kind of chemical on somebody or people, 
you're going to fly low enough so that it will actually drop on them. If you, if you put it up way in, in the stratosphere, it'll be halfway around the planet before it comes to ground. Yeah. Okay. So you can't control where it's falling. And if you want to, if you want to seed clouds and, and change the weather, you know, that, that has to be done in the mesosphere. Okay. So pay attention to where these, where these trails are. Are they in the troposphere, the mesosphere, or the stratosphere? Where are they? And what's going on in the stratosphere is scary as hell because that's what's telling us that an ice age is coming because our planet is changing. The atmosphere is changing. And, you know, if, if an ice age comes, that's all she wrote. Yeah. Right. I'm talking mass, mass starvation and violence against, you know, wars for resources in a, in a very serious and personal way. And the inability of, of people to be able to produce enough food to support, you know, the planet's population, whatever it might be at the time. So, yeah, pay attention to where they are, because then you'll know whether it's ice in the atmosphere in the, in the stratosphere or if they're trying to weather manage you or if they're trying to actually spray chemicals on you and you know make you breathe in you know crap well um, one of the the most ground shaking things that jay and i read in the wave series was related to harp and what was actually going on with harp and i didn't i didn't think about this as a question before but now that we're talking about it can you explain how HARP is frequency modulation? Because I think even your conspiracy people would say, oh, HARP is weather manipulation to be able to drum up a hurricane or something like that and put it where they want it. But when we read that about how HARP is frequency modulation, almost, this may be an exaggeration, but almost like a control mechanism of the matrix. Like if you had an electric fence for the matrix, the, the, like HARP is that fence. Could you explain like why most people that we're trying to explain how a harp is weather manipulation is really something completely different. Well, before, before you answer that though, I got to say, you can see it right now. This is my opinion personally, but you can see it right now, Laura and Hunter with just the people that are still wearing masks, that that's literally part of the mind control entrainment because it doesn't take anyone, but maybe at 80 IQ nitwit to know that masks are absolutely useless. They've been scientifically proven to be useless. And so if you're still wearing a mask in the general public today, anywhere, regardless of your age or believing in that, you're under some form of perverse mind control where you don't understand reality. Well, um, you know, according to the scenes, it's, it's mind control waves and they can target, you know, they can target areas and they can bounce it off. Right throw the atmosphere and make it come down here or there and they can and apparently they can produce quite a bit of um cover coverage and the seas also said something odd about it that it was got to to be utilized for transfer of perimeters right and transfer of perimeters um i never I never, I, I didn't know whether, whether they meant that it was to be utilized on behalf of fourth density uh, critters to help them in their moving around, you know, like literally transferring a, ch a chunk of space time from here to here. I mean, is that what they meant? I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, whenever we start having all of us in the house having weird dreams and, the, and we talk about our dreams, you know, and how similar they are, and then we'll post on the forum. Okay. You know, we had certain dreams and then there are people all over the planet and they post back what their dreams were. And we, and we take, we pay attention to how this happens because you, you kind of know <clears throat> when that sort of thing happens. That heart must be activated because people are having similar dreams and are about similar things. And what it is, is, is they put images and thought, I mean, they can transfer actual words or 
of concepts right directly into your head. And it depends on your nature and your makeup, how this gets unpacked. Right. Well, right. That's why not everybody is exactly the same because it depends on the individual. You know, some person may dream about, uh, uh, you know, water skiing and the other person may dream about drowning. And basically the, the dream is, is something about, you know, the information is something about water. Um, or a lot of water or water doing something, but, you know, but you notice also the numbers of shootings and acts of violence. And we've tracked that also, I mean, with, with our, with our forum and with all people, you know, paying attention and different ones have their specialties. Some of them pay attention to earthquakes and some people storms, some people bridge collapses, some people, right. you know, they've all got their little specialties. And what, what you notice is that, um, these things come in clusters. I mean, lately it's getting to the point where it's almost nonstop, but there for probably the last 20 years, that we, and we've been tracking it for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and you can almost always say, okay, heart must be activated because whatever program is put into this, and that's, just, that's something that can happen. People can be taken and programmed a la green bomb. Right. And art can be used to turn it on. Yeah. So you've got a thousand green bomb type people in the population and they want to activate them. All they got to do is use art. Boom. They're all turned on right. and they're doing whatever it is that they are programmed to do. Right. It's, it's. <laughs> well, th know. okay. So think, of, think about this. Be normal. Think of this shit. <laughs> So think about this, this is a profound way. podcast. Keep going. Think about this is we know they do that with the shooters or assassins. We know those are more or less, I don't know if they're green bomb necessarily, but they're basically mind controlled. But to, if people understood what the green bomb method or control or whatever's going method. on there. When I use it, I mean the method. It may, it may yeah. not be that particular exact program, but that's the method they use. Right. 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 And so, like you said, you take a thousand people across maybe a whole country, a couple different countries, and they get activated with the same sort of like behavior, weaponized behavior or whatever it is, and start interacting with people. I don't think it takes that many instances of a thousand people to interact with 10 or 20 people to where you have these like crazy sort of things happen across the planet all at the same time, which I had never pieced together with the green bomb and the hard power. Like you said, it's like a switch they can get flipped. You have a thousand people start to act crazy. Well, that can cause massive sorts of like riots or what war or whatever different thing is going on. Well, I mean, I think they did it in COVID. If you think about what happened in 2020, like in March, you know, it was released, they shut down society. And then there were the riots and all the cities remember in the summer, three or four months later, and they did all this. But I think Laura, the bigger question about this, because we could go all day on that topic is, why are some people like the people in your forum, the people that live with you, the people like Hunter and us, Hunter and I, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination, egoically stating like we're better or, or con condemning or judging the others, but why are some of us open to receiving this information, somewhat unable to be mind controlled versus so many that are, is, is it a higher density consciousness that is, uh, is what we are incarnated in physical third density? I mean, or are we, I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm kind of asking you, but like, why is there such a difference in consciousness between people? I think that, there are, well, there are diff differences in consciousness. There's a spectrum. Sure. And I mean, you know, you know this from um, any kind of, you know, study of animals or whatever, right. that there you know, all kinds of features can appear and disappear. And there's, uh, you know, there's some pretty specific genetic language that talks about it, but I don't, I, I don't have it right on my, you know, brain fingertips. But the thing is, I, the C say that the soul marries with the physical body if the right genetics are present. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that you have the, ability to expand within the parameters of your genetics. And there are souls that are, they, they 
made a decision to come back at this time. Now, whether they made it from fifth density uh, or from a fourth density existence, you know, I don't really know. Or maybe, you know, there's, there's been suggestions that there are six density souls that have come back to help mm -hmm. you. Uh, but that, you know, it, it would probably be a range, six density, fifth density, you know, because there's some that belong to fifth density and there are fourth density souls that make a choice. That, you know, it's like a, a pattern. And they make an agreement to come back to do certain things. Well, of course, once you enter into the body, uh, you have 50-50 chance of whether or not you <laughs> to remember that uh, or whether you're going to be sidetracked or distracted. And, you know, what's going to happen? Are you going to, are you going to wake up to what you came here to do? Uh, I've spent the last 20, 25 years trying, you know, waking up to what, right. what I'm supposed to do. And I guess I've been doing it in a... You know, I hope I've been doing it. I'm getting I'm getting a little old now, so I guess whatever it is, it's already close to being done. But uh, well, one of the things in your books that blew my mind, I know I sent this in email, and Hunter and I have talked about this, is when you saw your ex-husband in a trance, you know, one night saying, you know, being scolded by whatever was keeping you, you know, he was part of the forces that were keeping you down. And I, I mean, my wife now monica i mean we've we've had this story because i told her about that she hasn't read the book she's read she's start, she's on the second book i think right now but she's she had the same thing her ex-husband literally used to say if it's not in the bible it's fake you know and she had that she dealt with that for 21 years of her life and she's like so much guessing so anyway for the people that don't know you know i'm, I'm talking a little bit about your story and how you were married to somebody that was extremely religious so just, as many people are yeah. and when i married him you know i saw his religious proclivity to the positive thing you know because you don't want to have children with somebody who is right. a, a, a flu fluby right that's the male floozy and right. <laughs> so yeah but it it just got worse and worse and worse and i mean how many times can you can you be told you know that from the from the book of proverbs that you know a good woman is more priceless than a ruby and oh, they're rare and all that kind of stuff <laughs> and of course damn those lizards yeah so and then of course you know when i i was pressed on doing what i was gonna do i mean i, I wrote about it in my book amazing grace how how, you know, I decided I was going to buy a house and move my kids into it. And I told him he could stick or go. <laughs> so, uh, and then I, and that's where we started the, the Cassiopeian experiment. And, uh, and the more that happened, the more he passive aggressively tried to just do things. And then there, then there was that weird thing where those critters came in my bedroom that night. And I realized that he was as useless as the rest right. of the things you can think of. I'm not going to say tits on a bull. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Balls on a priest or tits on a nun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I swear, Laura, this is what's so insane is my wife had the exact same story. And, and, I, and, and when I was reading your work, you know, I, I really empathized with her and yourself because I thought about, you know, she would tell me she was like, I wanted to leave him, but I just didn't know how. And then I thought about his mother and how much I was so connected to his mother because she was such a nice person. So I know how hard it is when you're a mom and you're, you have that maternal energy and you want to just provide and protect and nurture and nature. I have five and, and, children. Yeah. I, yeah. She had three with him, but so yeah. similar. Right. So it's like, you're like, in a way, like, you know, like your soul, your higher self is telling you that you have to get out, but there, there's a part of you that's saying, well, I also took this oath. I made this agreement, you know, at marriage and, and as a woman, I can fix it. I'm the great creator. I'm, you know, I'm the center of creation. Right. And tried, and I realized at one point that I was going to die. Right. Literally. literally. And then my children would be left with him. And then what would happen to them? And I, I, and I also realized that I was setting a piss poor example for my girls, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, I mean, if somebody living with somebody like Rhett is like being eaten by a single piranha. That's true. 
Nashes, Nashes, and death Nashes, and Nashes. Cuts. Death what? by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts. You know? And, and eventually, you know, you look down and your old buddy's like, a lot of these shredded part, you know? So I just, mixed, I knew that I was going to die if I didn't do something. And I, and I, and, and he was very unhappy too because, you know, I was doing things he didn't approve of. And I wasn't going to stop doing them because to me, it was right. So, but based on what you witnessed in the middle of that night, do you think that's what's going on? That all of these people like him, like my wife's ex husband, I mean, I could tell you stories about him. He still hasn't, I mean, I, I won't get into that, but are they under the, the power and, and the control of these fourth density beings to take sure. away people like us from our job or our destiny? And I mean, think about what happened the night I, I hypnotized this gal, you know, her name was Pat, but. Uh, I think I gave her a different name in the, in the, yeah. in the, sorry. But anyhow, that there was a UFO over my house when I had her under hypnosis. That was a special situation, of course. I know that, you know, and that she wasn't able to tell me what I, well, you know, she was married to a scientist who worked at Fort Detrick. There you go. Fort Detrick, man. Talk about a place with all sorts of negative so, stuff going on. God. That, that whole thing. No wonder. There was a UFO over my house because, you know, they were probably creating COVID at the time. Uh, I think it was created a couple for DJ. I really So did. how much then relative to that, how much are these people that work in the dark projects? And by the way, that's what I was telling you. Shane Bales is an amazing guy. He wrote a blog called The Ruiner. The Ruiner. Hunter and I are very familiar with his work. He's actually a close friend of mine. He was in the special projects and all that. And he... Tells the story about the Dracomoids. I mean, his stuff lines up exactly with your stuff. It's incredible. And, I, and I'm friends with him. And, and this is so crazy and random. But literally, he messaged me yesterday on Facebook, which I never go on Facebook anymore. But I went on Facebook because I got a ping. And it was him. And he was like, hey, man, I haven't talked to you in so long. What's going on? And I was just like, this is insane. But anyway, he talked about this. How much of the people that are in these, you know, Boeing and you know, again, the special projects, the dark projects, aeroforce, you know, I mean, I mean, aerospace and all of that. How many of these people are aware of these fourth density forces? And then how many of them are actually just under severe, like clockwork, oranging mind control, like the astronauts probably were under, and they don't even know that they're actually under their influence. I'd say probably 83% don't know and 17% do. And and in that 17%, there's different levels of need to know. Right. So, you know, at the lowest levels, they, they know a little bit. And then as it gets towards the center, they know more and more and more. So I'd say about 83% are, um, and, and come on, you read the wave and you read. Yeah, the seas talk about it. Yeah. yeah. About, uh, you know, neurochemicals and how people are programmed. And for most people, all you need is that ordinary societal familial programming, and they can control you by putting somebody in proximity to you who totally is your programs. Or, I mean, they Eve Lorgan wrote a book about love bites, yeah, love bites. That's right on the money on about that. I mean, she and I don't agree on a lot of things, but she was she was really right on the money about people getting love bite situations. Or they get taken, you know, where if they're moving a little too close to something or in a certain direction, they, you know, are not wanted to be, be going, you know, someone will be brought in and fall in love and then that's it. Uh, to, to that point, Laura, I wonder, is there deal brokering going on between not, we know it's not the United States government, but basically just the one world government and hyperdimensionals for exchange of technology or power or anything like that where they're saying hey if you do this for us in terms of like human interaction that we're going to give you this i i just wondered like is all the black magic is all the deal brokering or whatever a way for them to think that a third density service self-being becomes a fourth density service self-being or there's like some payoff or something that they're trying to get from these these entities well, okay, uh, on one level, there was, as I understand it, and I understand this from several different sources, not just seas, that there was an agreement between certain aliens and the U.S. military or those, you know, the secret government or the, whatever they are, the cabal. Yeah, whoever. <laughs> they would 
exchange with them certain technology in exchange for uh, permission to be abducting people and using them experimentally and so forth. But of course, they were assured that they would put them back and everything would be fine. And it wasn't too long before the U.S. Uh, side, uh, the government side, discovered that the aliens lied and that they were abducting far more people than they said they would. And they were doing, in some cases, some extreme damage. And there were cases, you know, like I said, of human mutilations. And then there was cattle mutilations going on. And you notice how these cattle mutilations get covered up so fast. I don't know if you've read, read Linda Moulton Howell's book. Yes. Cattle mutilations. Yeah. And, you know, I sat there and listened to her uh, giving a talk once. And she was, had just come back from investigating a particular case. And it had all the elements of the hyperdimensional aspects, but she wasn't tuned into that really at that point. She's still thinking in third density terms. And her voice was literally shaking, you know, while she was talking because she described this incident about this cow being moved and whatever was moving, it was invisible, lifted it up, dropped it down, whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, the, um, there was an agreement. Now, is there an agreement? Is there a promise on the part of these fourth density beings to the uh, world government, people like Klaus Schwab and all those people? <laughs> uh, and I would say Klaus Schwab is probably, you know, he's probably in bed with the Lizzie's, but it's literally well, he has to be, you know. What's um, the other guy? You've all, you've all, Harry, where we're, we're all humans. Yeah, are, all are rarity. Act. Yeah. Um, you know, is there a, a deal that they are going to be at the top of the of the food chain when the changeover comes, when the aliens come into their own, when we pass into a fourth density world, assuming that we do, uh, and the, the aliens are then able to interact with people directly? Um, is are they promised to be at the top of the food chain? And I think that there is some such agreement. I think the seas have alluded to that and, and almost even said it directly. The problem is, is that, you know, everyone knows in any case like that, the aliens will look upon these individuals as traitors to their kind. Sort of, exactly. And they, you know, nobody will, you know, they'll use a traitor but they won't ever trust him. That's right. That's what I was saying. It's the ultimate, as you, as you in, described to the seas and you, the, the, the ultimate service to self paradigm is that they just continue to eat themselves top yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. They don't realize the ultimate outcome of this game. They don't. And it's, I mean, think about what's his name. Is it, uh, is it Zuckerberg? Zuckerberg. Who, who's digging a, some yeah, he's building, he's building an underground thing in Hawaii right now. Yeah. In Hawaii, you know, like Hawaii is going to survive. And then there's <laughs> all of these seeds up in Svalbard, Sweden. Like, we're not going to have an ice age. These people are not being given the truth. No, they're cool. And all of them, they don't know what's really going on. And they're doing some of the stupidest things I've ever seen people do. Yeah. Well, It'll be interesting. I mean, the C said that uh, when that day comes, it'll be a triple bad day for people like the Rockefellers. Yeah, all of them. Well, that's another interesting question. How are you doing right now, uh, energy wise and time and everything? Good. I'm fine. Awesome. Um, so, so that's the, so that's a fascinating thing, right? So we know that we know that the C's have told us that there's these undergrounders. And they kind of insinuated in one of your calls that Zuckerberg was one, even though they're not really allowed to tell us that. But obviously, I mean, there's been so many pictures of Zuckerberg in the past with his black eyes and these just random images that are like, what is going on? Is he a clone? Is he a replicant? Is he a hybrid? Whatever. So, I mean, the undergrounders, let's talk about them because Hunter and I have always theorized that many of the influencers on planet or topside today don't make sense. They're always negative. They look at other humans that they talk to with these like beady eyes. They never smile. There's never, there's never joy or, or, or positive men or mental energy. And we could mention names, but we won't uh, just for now. 
is are a lot of the influencers, the people with these massive audiences, undergrounders and, and, and part of their hybridized species? Well, there might be some. As Caesar said, there's a lot of them walking around on Earth now. So with yes. Yeah, uh, but they also said that there is a group underground who you know, called the Nation of the Third Eye, and uh, right. it's a job, you know, to basically. Uh, I don't know how they do it. So I was going to say, oh, they lay down and go into a trance and project their thoughts, but maybe they don't have to lay down and go into a trance. Maybe they are assigned a certain group of people. And it's their job to, you know, pull the levers and push the buttons on those people to control them. And I would say a lot of the influencers are this type of individual. Right. There are probably a lot of others that are just simply completely programmed with social and familial programming that, and, and uh, that includes what's been going on in our universities for the past 20 years, which has produced this crop of absolutely insane people. The thing that there's more than two genders or more than two. I, I, I watched a video not long ago. It says, oh, we well, you know, sex assigned at birth. What do you mean sex assigned? <laughs> well, you are, you either have a penis or a vagina. You are either right. a male or a female. And they said, well, well, there's, there's a, there's a spectrum of genders. And I, spectrum of genders. I mean, what? What has to happen to a person to turn their brain to oatmeal like that? I mean, it's not right. like oatmeal, it's freaking tapioca. Well, something happened today, this morning, and I Hunter already knows about it. And it was such a powerful conduit of me connecting something that literally, I'm not kidding you, the power in my house went completely out for seven minutes. I thought it was in the neighborhood. I mean, I was texting Hunter. He knows what it is. I won't get into it, but it was like a very profound revelation to me about that. And all of a sudden I'm in the middle of doing my cardio on my bike and my bike went off and I'm like, what? And then I thought it was maybe a short and I went out to talk to my wife who's in the backyard working on our patio. And I said, did the power go out? She's like, I don't know. I'm out here doing the deck. And I'm like, and I'm looking around cause it was early this morning and the power's out in my entire house. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm walking out to the circuit breaker. And then as I'm walking out to the circuit breaker, whoo, it came back on. It was like literally a short, but it, it's relevant to what you're talking about. This transgender stuff is a massive psyop from them to teach. To it's an, it's essentially an attack on masculine energy, just as it is on feminine energy, and it's been on the feminine energy, as you know, way longer time. But it's more recent with the masculine energy because they really do want people to be utterly confused what their role is as a biological organism. It's insane. But as you know, we know why. They tell us. The seas have told us. It's not fun to talk about it. Oh, beautiful. It's not fun to talk about it, but they're literally creating vehicles for them to reincarnate into in both fourth, third and fourth density that are insane. But I, you know, I don't think that I don't think that's what they're doing with these transgender people. That's not their purpose. Uh, and you got to understand that, that they got all of this from their education. So the people who are doing the educated, educating are undoubtedly the ones who are being, you know, mind control. Right. I mean, because you can take one person and completely mind control them, right. and right. put all this stuff in their head. And then send them out there to be, you know, a teacher, a professor, and they can, you know, corrupt thousands upon thousands of students over a number of years. And then you, so, you know, taking over the educational system is undoubtedly a goal. Okay. So as far as undergrounders go, uh, the Cs have talked about, you know, the hybrids that they've been creating underground, that they're by density, that they can, they can move in. And I think the by density ones. Uh, and they're they're pretty smart, so I I wouldn't class them with the idiots, because they're probably you know flying under the radar. Right, that's that's what's happening. You know, and and they're just you know they may influence other people. That's what I that's what I meant. They're 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 more of influencing, and they're doing it from the shadows. Yeah, so there's a lot of that I think, 
and um, and they may even be some of them may even be teachers or professors, and they know what they're doing. They don't believe what they're teaching, but they you know want to inculcate that into the heads of you know all of these you know open-minded poor kids that go in there and get these educations. I mean. I swear people should just take their kids out of school. I was going to just say that to you. You know, obviously I have daughters that are 16 and 14 and they already know that I'm not paying. I mean, this is the truth. I mean, I'm very open about this. I'm not paying for them to go to college. Um, If they end up going to college for a specific reason, because it's their desire for whatever industry or trade or whatever it is they want to do, that's fine. But they have to get a full scholarship, either athletically or academically. I'm not paying for it. And truthfully, by then, it's because they're still three years away. I probably might just overrule it and say you can't. Yeah. (laughs) Because they really are bastions of transhumanism, Luciferianism, Satanism. Yeah. Yeah, because I would... Even then, I knew that there was something that was really wrong about what they were doing. And it wasn't anywhere near as bad 25 years ago, you know, 30 years ago, whatever. So, yeah, it's um, it's a big mess. So the thing that's interesting about transhumanism is to me, it's almost like species engineering in a way. Do you think that has anything to do? This is just rampant speculation with turning humans into almost like a cyborg, kind of like the grays or like the marching agents for the reptoids or, you know, fourth density beings. Do you think they're doing that to prep for an invasion so that humans are more pliable and controllable to be these like organic slash inorganic, like biobots? Sure, Chris, you can't, uh, you can't take, uh, people that are fairly normal and send them out to control, you know, th- their friends and neighbors and family, because right. at some point it's gonna it's gonna get to them and they're gonna not do it. So what are you gonna do? You create an army of them with uh, implants in their brains or certain drugs that change their DNA or um, certain drugs that change the way they think, you know, wipe out their memories. They've got, they've got drugs that they're working on that are supposed to make you forget so that you don't suffer PTSD from killing people. You know, it's well, I mean, look, so yeah, I think that they're, I mean, that's part of it because I don't think that those are the ones that they are exactly, I don't think they're engineering those necessarily for their own entry. And, I, you know, whether it's incarnation or whether they, you know, enter in, in as a form of possession, um, you know, it could be six, one, half a dozen of the other. So uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm, I'm well, one of the one of the uh, I think there's was cited a couple of times across different wave books that Jay and I will always go back to is I forget how it intros, but it was like. I think there was something about Bob Lazar and then he said 90 or the C said 94% for right. what for, yeah. for consumption. And then it was like, as what? And I think it was one of the more disturbing ones that you talked about yeah. of like humans being used for consumption. And that always just both Jay and I, it gave us like this pit in our stomach when we would read that because it seems so it, re- it calibrated is so true with us, but then it was also so disturbing at the same time. It was, it's, it's really horrifying. And when you look at it and it how, consumed how, I don't know if you remember the part where we were talking about, you know, torture and so forth and how, uh, the native Americans would torture people because they, they felt that, you know, that they could, if the person withstood the torture really well, you know, obviously he's a very courageous person and they could absorb that strength and courage from him and they may even need a body part unreal you know to to consume that um but when you're talking about the massive amount of child trafficking and you know human trafficking females whatever young boys that are being trafficked and a lot of them are being trafficked for snuff films you know and people uh absorb energy from that they've been tracked right. for the production of what they call adrenochrome and some of them are being consumed i mean there there are so many cases and, and it is so incredibly horrifying and 
so far out of the range of what normal people think about, talk about, or have been exposed to in their daily lives that it's it's hard to believe, but it is happening and it's becoming more out in the open now than it ever has been before. The same way the UFO phenomenon, David Grish and, and these other various people that are bringing out the fact that this is real, you know, that there have been contacts between, you know, upper echelon military individuals and um, other terrestrial, extraterrestrial, ultra terrestrial, whatever you want to call them beings, and that it's real. And of course, the minute it starts to come out and, and something is dripped out to the public, then, you know, the cover up machine just goes into full operation. <laughs> and, you know, that reminds me, you know, poor Richard Dolan, he was here once a few, you know, some years, maybe 10 years ago. And we had a long talk about it. And I, I, I gave him the wave and, and secret history. And he was reading some of it and he, he was just so horrified. Oh, he couldn't believe it. He, he, be, he believed that there was a breakaway civilization that was going to make everything right, that they were working behind the scenes and undercover and they were going to come out and fix everything, you know, uh, and, the white hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were all going to, and, and it's, it just isn't going to be that way. You know, the C said recently, you know, that uh, the whole, it's all happening to wake people up. Right. And the question is, how far does it have to go before they wake up? I mean, how much suffering must they endure? Because suffering is what wakes you up. And it, so far, they're enduring quite a bit. So, obviously it's got to get a lot worse and you know for the rest of us you know who are always saying you know we're saying all right already we know <laughs> yeah enough stop no! so we have to endure it too because yeah. there's idiots out there are waking up so well, it's, it's going to get a lot lot worse i mean i mean i mean well how many people are not i mean that because that brings up a better question is how many people are actually not capable you know from a frequency resonance vibration of waking up probably 50 percent. yeah scary they're not capable it's an operative term right because you talk about it in secret history which you didn't really talk about it in in the wave which i thought was kind of fascinating regarding the um, the idea of portals, organic portals. Yeah, because the seas hadn't talked about organic portals. Yeah, right. when I read the wave. I read the wave. Right. Well, that's, that came up. And it was while I was writing the wave that I was starting to experience the whole thing about psychopaths. Yeah. And it was after the wave that I did all the, the research on the psychopathy. So there was a lot that came after the wave. The wave is, is the groundwork, but there is, you know, we have not stopped having sessions. Yeah, no, I know. Well, so that's actually a really good question. So why don't you explain that? I think, I mean, I, I, I it's obviously a difficult thing to talk about, but you know, you talked about in secret history, um, that literally, and this goes way back, you know, before, before the fall slash after the, 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 um, the flood or whatever, many, there, maybe there've been many floods. I think they said there have been, but, um, where there's essentially sold beings and unsold or non-sold beings. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit about that? Well, um, yeah. In fact, I was, I was reading something about it today. Let me find the right word that he was using for this. It was kind of entertaining. Let me change glasses so I can see what I'm reading. Um, Meaning zombies. So what he says is, why didn't we evolve as meaning zombies? Natural selection has no interest in the quality of your inner life. We cannot explain in evolutionary terms why we are not meaning zombies. And what a meaning zombie is, they have conscious experience but this is restricted to meaningless sensations. A meaning zombie has no experiential understanding of the word world. And then he goes on to say that it's thought that 
An infant's consciousness consists of perceptions of meaningless colors, shapes, and physical sensations. As the infant develops, its meaningless experiences gradually acquire meaning. But a meaning zombie grows up and develops normal behavior and information processing in the brain its experiences do not acquire meaning. A meaning zombie has functional understanding, but it has no experiential understanding. Then he compares these meaning zombies, which apparently zombie is a technical term among philosophers, but they use it as a thought experiment because he says, you know, of course, we, I don't really think that these exist. But um, the meaning zombie is compared to AI. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. I mean, look at the, the the computer that defeated Gary Kasparov in, in chess. Now, this thing it obviously knows chess. It knows, you know, how to play. But it doesn't understand the meaning of anything. And you look at Grok on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting AI. I mean, far more interesting than that stupid thing they came up with with Google. The uh, chat. GTP or whatever the hell it is. Are you are you talking about the new Google like one? Yeah, the one the one that made like black Vikings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, obviously they do not understand meaning, and so basically, what this guy Philip Goss has described as a meaning zombie is what the C's described as organic portals, and basically they are uh, individuals who who, um, you know, are, are evolutionarily stable, but they don't have individuated souls. Right. And then you think about what the C said about Neanderthals. They said, okay, Neanderthals were there. And then souls uh, went into them or inserted themselves in them and changed the Neanderthal genes by their presence. And so it might be something similar. Because organic portals, uh, and the Caesar said that organic portals, when they're defective, they can be psychopaths. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult concept. And, of course, they've said that about 50% of the population is organic portals, that they are not fully sold beings. So that's what we're dealing with. And obviously, these organic portals could be nurtured and cared for and taught properly and exampled for in a, in a very positive way, which would increase their potential for uh, evolving their genetics so that they could or their children could embody souls. But that's not what's happening. There being, I, I would say, a whole bunch of these uh, so-called transgenders are, are simply organic portals. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, I mean, that makes the most sense because they're so utterly confused. They don't feel a sense of feminine or masculine energy. They're, 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 I mean, they're, they're, they're confused. But I, I will say this from a scientific process. A lot of people don't know this, but when they do the reverse sex change or chop their things off, do you realize they can't even have an orgasm after they do that? So can you imagine? What's it? It's like they have lost any potential whatsoever for growth. Right. Because, I mean, I'm telling you, uh, you know, there's a lot more to sex than people think there is. I mean, yes, yeah. if it's the wrong kind of sex, it's feeding forth then to the SDS, yeah. you know, because they're, you know, they're putting people out there to be players, you know, one night stands, you know, right. with 50 men, you know, over a period of however many years and one man, you know, a different woman every night or whatever. And they don't realize that, you know, when you're having sex, you know, it, it, there's electrical energy that's forming into a vortex at different, you know, points on your anatomy, probably your chakra points or something. And there's an exchange of energies. And so a guy goes and he has sex with one woman this night, and the next night he goes and has sex with another woman, and he's still carrying the energies of that previous woman, and right. he's changing energies with the next woman. And some of those energies include the energies of the previous woman. And the same thing with women. They, go, they have sex with one guy, and they, you know, they've got energies that they've exchanged with him. So they've got some of his energies in them, and then they go have sex with another man. 
And then, you know, so it's, it's just, you know, and it destroys their health and it destroys their minds. And, well, if you want to talk and take it deeper, and again, I'm not castigating uh, people who are homosexual, but think of men who could have 12 partners in one night. Is that possible? Yes. I mean, I'm not sure you have multiple orgasms, but I... No, a man, I mean, they've done experiments with rats. It just has to be different DNA. But I mean, no, like, you know, in, in, in the gay community, there's like one who's the giver and one who's the taker. So with drugs and everything else, no, but I mean, honestly, this is like insane to, to think about what you're talking about. Cause you're always talking about it as in a male female role. But if you get down into the whole aspect of male men, gay men, it gets even insaner because of the energy transfer. Yeah. And the thing is, is most gay men, when they're searching for a partner, they want a man who is, you know, a man. Right. Exactly. We want, we want to take a man who is, a man and basically heterosexual and convert him because that's their ideal. I don't right. know if read Harvey Cleckley's uh, I car have. caricature of loans. Yes. So, totally insane. Yeah. So, and, and people don't realize that properly undertaken, you know, the sex can be a very beneficial thing. I mean, I, I think you were talking, weren't you talking about that on, on your other video yeah. that I watched and, you were, and people were talking about retention, you know, Gurji have talked about sex, uh, to some extent, but not in, not in any kind of graphic terms, but yeah, he said that there are some people who should have more sex. Some right. people who shouldn't have sex at all. Some people who should have you know, sex in certain ways, whatever. And, it, and, you know, as far as he was concerned, it wasn't how you had sex, you know, if you had kinks or whatever, that's irrelevant. You know, what was important was that you didn't misuse the energy, that you didn't try to use it, you know, for emotional reasons or, you know, intellect or let it usurp your intellect. And um, so, yeah, it, uh, if you, if you know about sexual energy, and I think, I think most men need a discharge because it keeps the prostate clean. That's, that's correct. That's <laughs> absolutely correct. But it's supposed to be coitus. It's not supposed to be masturbation. Not to say that they probably can't exchange no, between the two. You yeah. understand that when you have intercourse, there's an exchange of electrical energies. Right. Uh, you know, there's some anatomical things about it that, uh, you know, like what a man has on the underside of his penis and then what a woman has, you know, the so-called G-spot, whatever. And women, women ejaculate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A lot of people don't know that, but they do, and they can. And women can have multiple orgasms in, in one session. And and usually when a woman has orgasm, a demand is absorbing energy from her. He's absorbing creative energy. Right. And it's done properly when he's done. But if he finally finishes, he will not be tired. That's right. It's when it, 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 once you feel at the end that you're just, then you know you haven't been doing it right. Right. Or something, That's you right. know, something's going on. Because there wasn't an exchange of the energy which synced up between the man and the woman. It was like one person using that. Yeah, robbing. Their, robbing. Yeah, their, yeah, their energy. Now, and, and, and if a man is interested enough that he wants a woman to have, you know, a five or six orgasms before he decides that it's time for him, then you know then it's usually a, a fair exchange <laughs> totally true That's totally my... true it's it's amazing how little people understand about sex and you know that was one of the good things i thought about the barbara marstiniak books if we can transition to that before we end this 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 show today and move move to the next one um is that she talked a lot about the aspect of creative energy and the power that, you know, it, it, she likened it to like nuclear, you know, anti-gravity. I mean, the energy release and transformation from sex from, and, and, and again, if we really truly do understand like the divine masculine and the, and the divine feminine, the equal but opposite energetic poles, there is a recept, a reception and a union from both fields. And so like when they're used correctly, the energy is like, I mean, it's divine. It's, it, it's creation force energy. 
Yeah, but it, 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 it's mostly focused and centered in on what ha what is happening in the individual. Right. We got to be careful about the create your own reality thing, but we'll talk about that the next time because that's that's a whole can of worms. And I really yeah, you it. taught me a lot about that. Hunter and I learned a lot from you in that because we were really caught up in the new age. You know, because Neville Goddard says env envision your life as the wish fulfilled. But you know, if you're coming from a really, really bad frequency resonance and vibration, it's difficult to create a resonant reality. But yeah, we'll we'll definitely get into that. Um, but and we're I'll, two hours in. Sure. You yeah, what'd you say? I said I'll tell you some stories when we talk about. It. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, Hunter, do you have anything else you want to ask her real quick that's relevant to what we're talking about? Uh, I think that's it for today. I definitely, I'm, I know we'll do, we're going to do some more. I have a lot around uh, the uh, Christianity stuff, just from my own background and uh, having read that book and kind of revisited a few times. So we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but this was amazing. I'm like, I was on the edge of my seat the whole time and my mind is blown. I know other people will be too. So thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, Laura, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I, I can't wait to talk about religion. I've always said that religion has been the great opiate of the masses, and it truly is the, the mass. It's the main mind control lever. But it can also be the main binder. What does the word religion mean? Really guard right. to right. join together. If to join it's together, right, yeah. If it's done right, it joins people together. You're right. So, 100%. unfortunately, lizards control our religion, so we don't have it. <laughs> Opportunity yes, that. they do. And when you tell people that, man, it's so difficult. All right, well, we'll end the show. So, guys, uh, guys and gals, thank you guys so much for watching this. This is part one. We will be back with part two very soon. Mm -hmm.